When I first started on bassoon, I used to think that as long as I knew one fingering for every single note on the bassoon that I would be fine and I wouldn't have to learn any alternate fingerings. Boy, was I wrong. There are so many times in your everyday playing where you need to use an alternate fingering to be able to play a note cleanly or even just to get a note to speak. In this video, I'm gonna be covering the most common alternate fingerings that I think every bassoonist, no matter what your level is, should be aware of. And I'll also cover what situations you need to use those alternate fingerings in. If this is our first time meeting, my name is Dr. Natalie Law and I'm a professional bassoonist and teacher and I love to help students just like you learn how to play the bassoon. If you're not already, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and let me know down in the comments any questions that you have about alternate fingerings or bassoon playing in general. When we talk about alternate fingerings, we tend to think about them as notes in isolation, individual notes or fingerings that we need to use in a specific situation. But most of the time we use an alternate fingering because there's a specific note combination. There's a note that comes right before the alternate fingering or a note that comes immediately after it that is gonna force us to use that alternate fingering. So for all the alternate fingerings I'm going to talk about today, there is a reason for why you should use them. And you not only need to learn the fingerings themselves, but you need to learn how to identify them in the music. And so whenever you see that particular note combination or you see uh, a certain situation in the music, then you know on the fly to be able to use those alternate fingerings. So the first really common alternate fingering that everybody pretty much needs to know is front F sharp. And this works for two octaves, the, oct the F sharp immediately below the bass clef staff and then the F sharp at the second to top line of the bass clef staff. So typically when we play those F sharps, we play them with our right thumb on this key right here. And that is called the back F sharp or rear F sharp or standard F sharp. But the other F sharp that you really need to know is front F sharp and it's the exact same fingering, but instead of this key in the back, you're going to put your pinky on this key in the front right here. So this pinky key, it's not this one, it's this one, is going to take the place of the back F sharp fingering. So we use this front F sharp for whenever your right thumb has to make a leap over the pancake key, usually to go to the B flat key. For example, if you are going from F sharp to B flat, your thumb with the standard fingering has to go from this key below the pancake key up to this B flat key. When your thumb has to make that leap, you get a little bobble in between from the F sharp to the B flat. Usually there's a note that happens in between because your right thumb can't move as quickly. So instead of that motion, we're gonna go from F sharp in the front to the normal B flat fingering with our right thumb. The motion is then instead of thumb to thumb, it's right pinky to right thumb. This motion is more conducive to a cleaner transition anytime you have to move from the F sharp to the B flat. That's also true if you need to, if you are using the E flat fingering that involves that right thumb on the B flat key. So anytime that you have to move from F sharp to that E flat, that full E flat fingering, that's another time where you'd wanna use the front F sharp instead of the back F sharp. And this is one of the reasons why I tend to not like the full E flat fingering as sort of my go-to fingering. I tend to just use just the left hand because I'd have to constantly be using the front F sharp fingering um, in order, and it just adds an extra step of complication uh, when we're playing that E flat. So for me in particular, I use the one-handed E flat fingering for that very reason, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the later in the video. So another fingering that I wanna talk about is A flat, and this again applies to the A flat at the bottom of the bass clef staff and at the top of the bass clef staff. The standard fingering for A flat involves this 
right pinky. The reason I'm saying something about this is because I see so many students who I come to work with, especially beginning students who struggle to reach that key with their pinky. So instead they will play a key down here below the F sharp key. Now on my bassoon, I have actually two because I have an A flat, B flat trill key on my bassoon, but um, on most student bassoons, there's just one key below the F sharp key. And that is an alternate A flat key. If you're just using the regular pinky A flat key, then just stick with using that all of the time. There's really not many situations where you're gonna wanna stretch your right thumb way down to get that, that alternate A flat key. So it's not really an alternate fingering that I recommend, but I see so many students using it that I just wanna point out that you should not use that alternate fingering. You should just use the standard pinky A flat key if you can reach it. Now, there are some students who for one reason or another because of the size of their hands or the way their particular instrument is configured, they have a hard time reaching that pinky key. And so they will use the thumb as the thumb A flat as an alternative. And in that situation, if you physically can't reach the A flat key or it's so painful to do that over and over, I would say that's fine if you're a younger student and you still have maybe have some growing to do. Um, but if at all possible, you should try to use the pinky standard A flat fingering. So the next fingering I'm gonna talk about is the E flat in the staff fingering, which I mentioned a little bit earlier with the F sharp uh, combination, but I want to talk more in depth about the different options for E flat. So as I said, my standard fingering for that E flat fingering is just with one hand and it's whisper key, thumb on the whisper key, and then one, three, and the left pinky key. And that's my go-to E flat fingering. Now some students find that to be really unstable and have a hard time getting a solid pitch and generally if that E flat is really unstable with the one with the one hand that usually means there's something wrong with the reed or maybe there's an issue with how you're voicing the note you should be able to play that E flat with some stability regardless even if it's not your favorite note the reason being that even if you are using an E flat fingering where you're adding the right hand you still have to be able to use that one-handed E flat fingering. So for example, if you're playing scales or anything really technically difficult and you have to play that E flat and uh, rapidly, you do need to be able to play the one-handed version because that's where that would come in even if your go-to E flat fingering involves the right hand. Now, the, there's a couple options for the right hand um, fingering for E flat. One that I will use from time to time is sort of a muted fingering and it's adding this tone hole, also adding the B flat key in the back. So that is the sort of muted E flat fingering. You get more of a muted sound. Um, and I definitely use that E flat fingering anytime I need to play really soft or um, I really just need to have a really stable, ongoing background sort of sound, that's really where I would use that muted A flat. So that's another good one to have on hand no matter what your go-to E flat fingering is. Another sort of standard go-to E flat fingering that um, a number of bassoonists use is the full or two hand E flat. So it's whisper key and then one and three, just like the left hand. Typically people don't use the the resonance key to my knowledge, um, at least I haven't found the resonance key to be helpful for the full E flat fingering. So just the forked one and three uh, option in your left hand. And then instead of the first finger, you'll add the second finger or middle finger in your right hand. And then again, the B flat key um, thumb in the back. And that's the full E flat fingering. Tone, the tone of that note tends to be a little bit brighter and a little bit louder. Um, so I will use that full E flat fingering if I really need to project and I really need a big, full, loud sound. I will use the E flat fingering because when you try to use that 
when you try to get a full sound with the one-handed E flat fingering, you can't always quite project as much because you're not using as large a part of the instrument to be able to make that sound. So I use all three of those E flat fingerings on a regular basis. But again, just the one-handed E flat is sort of my go-to. And there even are other E flat alternate fingerings out there that you can use and, and certainly people have other variations of that. Um, if you use another variation of E flat or have kind of another perspective on that note, feel free to comment down below what you think about it. Um, but those are some ideas for how to approach the E flat. And I think that every bassoonist, even if you are just starting out on bassoon, you at least need to be aware that there's more than one fingering available for E flat and you'll eventually want to become comfortable with at least two of them. So you have some options, you have some tools in your toolbox when it comes to E flat because it's kind of a unique note that we have to deal with. The next common alternate fingering that most bassoonists should be aware of, especially if you're a little bit more advanced and you're playing more in the upper register, that's where you run into needing to know more alternate fingerings. And this one in particular is one that you kind of have to know if you want to play certain note combinations. The note I'm referring to is high F sharp or the F sharp that is above the bass clef staff. And this particular note is typically played um, with two, three. Uh, many bassoonists, including myself, will play with the first finger open. Um, a lot of fingering charts will say like, that it should be half hole. And so you can experiment with your bassoon and find, you know, does it sound better? Is it easier to play um, with the half hole, like mostly open, or is it better to play with the finger completely off? I play with it completely off and I know a lot of other people do as well. And then we add this key finger and this finger. And then I also play with this pinky on the bottom here as well. And that is my kind of standard high F sharp fingering. But if you try to play that fingering coming from say a high B flat um, or certain higher notes above um, where you're basically you're going from what would look like this to this, you're just basically you're just lifting this finger and then you would be moving your thumb in the back from a high, high B flat to that F sharp. Um, you're essentially not enough fingers are moving in that particular fingering combination to be able to allow the F sharp to speak. You'll find that when you play the B flat and then you play the F sharp, the F sharp just won't like the sound will slightly change, but the F sharp won't actually speak. And that's because the fingerings aren't changing enough to make a difference in the sound. So in order to play that particular note combination, especially if you're slurring, if you're tonguing, you generally can play the standard fingering. So the alternate, well, an alternate fingering that you can use uh, for that particular note combination is where you're just have your middle finger down in your left hand, and then you still retain the one, two, and this pinky key in the right hand. Um, and it, that particular fingering can be really unstable. It may not work for you depending on your read and your bassoon in that particular moment, um, but that is an option for you. Um, typically, if I have a lot of uh, technical, difficulties in the high register that'll kind of be my go-to F sharp just because it's pretty simple and basic. Another option uh, to get more of a stable F sharp uh, from that B flat to F sharp finger motion is to instead of the pinky key in the right hand to add the B flat thumb key in the right thumb. Basically you're switching off thumbs. You're switching from the left thumb coming off to the right thumb coming on, that makes enough of a difference in the air column changing or you know whatever physics are happening inside the bassoon to be able to play the F sharp. So again, for that high F sharp, there's a couple different options and you or someone you know may be even using different variations of that. Those certainly aren't the only fingerings or uh, variations of those fingerings that you can use. There's other 
tricks and things that you can add in that you might find from other places. The final fingering that I think is important for most bassoonists to at least be aware of are the different forms of the high A flat fingering. So we talked before about the two lower A flats in the bassoon range. Now I'm talking about the highest A flat on the instrument above the bass clef staff. And on this note, I want to just point your attention to a couple different variations of it because uh, for me, and I think for a number of bassoonists, using uh, more of a block fingering for the A flat is a better sounding stable uh, fingering approach, which what I mean by block is just that there's um, more finger, there's two fingers in the right hand and then the B flat key in the right thumb. And that fingering combination makes a really stable, um, generally in tune A flat, at least on my instrument. And I know again, there's some variations on that as well. Um, but another A flat fingering that I think actually some fingering charts kind of go to, which I don't love, is where you're playing the same thing in your left hand. That does that never changes. And just remember that for the A flat, you want to have the half hole open. And but it's not very much half hole because if you open it too much, then it'll squawk at you. And so it's just like the octave below half hole business that you have to be mindful of how much you're opening the hole. But in the right hand, you can just play this finger right here. And that A flat, so there's less fingers going on in the right hand, so it can be nice for faster technical passages. If you have a trill passage, you know, that can be an option for you because there's just less going on. But the trade-off is generally that the note is not usually in a tune, it's not usually as stable. Um, for me, the the tone isn't where I would want it to be as my sort of go-to A flat fingering. And then again, there are other variations on this A flat as well. So I don't think you necessarily need to memorize these exact fingerings that I just showed you, but just know that there are some options out there if you're struggling in a particular passage to use a different A flat fingering. Now the fingerings I talked about today are just a start to alternate fingerings. They're ones that I feel like I encounter all the time in my playing, and I feel like I encounter with my students and their playing, and I'm having conversations about. And some of them, especially when you're going from an F sharp to B flat, finger motion, you have to know those fingerings or else you'll just never be able to play that particular note combination. And there are certainly more fingerings out there that you can use. And a really good resource for finding a bunch of different alternate fingerings, especially when you're running into trills and things where you have to do kind of a really unique fingering to make a trill work is to go to the Toplansky Fingerings book, which is a really big book of all bassoon fingerings. It's one that I have had and have used on from time to time where I'm working on a solo piece and there's a hard passage and I'm having trouble technically with it. And so I go to that book and I try to find maybe there's a alternate fingering that I'm not aware of yet that I use in that particular situation. And that's how you generally pick up alternate fingerings is you come across something and you're playing that you can't quite play the way that it's written in the standard fingerings. And then you see if maybe there's an alternate fingering that's gonna make it easier to play. So, and the book itself is a little pricey, but if you were to get it, you would have a really comprehensive approach to alternate fingering. So if you're at that point and you're playing where um, you don't know a whole lot of alternate fingerings and that might be the next step for you is learning more of those things, that might be a good book to invest in um, because that's kind of the, the one-stop reference. So I want to talk just a bit about how do you learn and memorize these alternate fingerings. Well, as I said, you can come across them in your solo playing or etude or band or orchestra piece and you find that there's maybe something that you can't quite play, then you look for an alternate fingering and that is how you learn that fingering because you practice it in that piece and then you remember next time you come across that fingering combination, you kind of have that in the back of your mind. Oh, when I did this, I used this alternate fingering. That's kind of a good way to 
learn the alternate fingerings. I don't think it's a good idea to just try and learn a bunch of alternate fingerings and just try to memorize them all at once because you're less likely to have them stick. It's better if you can kind of focus on them one at a time and use them in context and then you just gradually build up a library of alternate fingerings that you can use when you need them. Another way to learn and sort of memorize these alternate fingerings is to use them in scales. So for example, the different E flat fingerings. Play your E flat major scale and use your go-to fingering, and then play the E flat major scale again and use an alternate fingering that you're not as comfortable with. And sort of incorporating them in your sort of warm-up fundamental uh, exercises can be a good way to get them in that way. Remember that an alternate fingering is used for a reason and that there's usually a note combination associated with it. And so it's not only memorizing the fingering that is important, but being able to identify when that fingering is gonna be used. For example, the F sharp to B flat combination tends to be a really common one that we come across or knowing when to use a different high A flat fingering and so on. So being able to identify those situations in your music, even when you're sight reading, when you see a note combination coming up in the music, that is the best way to, to know your alternate fingerings and use them in practice. And it just takes kind of gathering them and learning them over time um, and eventually they become a regular part of your playing and it's not a chore to have to go look up an alternate fingering and then keep reminding yourself to play. If this video was helpful for you, please give me a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and let me know down in the comments what fingerings, alternate fingerings do you find yourself using? Do you use any different variations of what I shared today? What do you find to be helpful and important to know when it comes to learning alternate fingerings?